Hello and welcome to the Islamophobia Watch podcast. I'm George, your host, and I welcome all faithful listeners as well as new listeners, regardless of the platform you're joining us on, whether it's Stitcher or Spotify or YouTube or SoundCloud. Um, the Islamophobia Watch podcast is syndicated across a number of different platforms. Uh, for those of you who happen to pick it up, uh, who knows where, our website is islamophobia.watch, where you can always visit and check on the latest. Uh, but today I have part one of my interview with one of Europe's leading anti-Sharia activists, and uh, it turned out to be a little longer than what I originally had planned, but it was so interesting. We went on for a while, and that's why I will break it up in two parts to make it easier for you to digest and, and listen. So without further ado, uh, join me for part one of my interview with Elizabeth Sabadich Wolf. Today I'm delighted to have with me Elizabeth Sabadich Wolf. Elizabeth, how are you today? <laughs> Hi, George. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thanks for having me on your show, and I'm doing great given the circumstances. That's great. I, I know that we talked a little bit before we got the recording going, and um, you know, we can touch on the whole COVID thing in regards to like how this is playing out in Europe, and that would be very interesting. But the reason I wanted to um, get in touch with you is, first of all, I've known about your work, and I've been following it uh, in the last probably four years or so, and I'm, and I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed and inspired both. And so I wanted to um, get in touch with you and revisit your battles and what you've been doing in Europe and help people here specifically in Minnesota and the United States uh, to um, just to understand a little better exactly what's going on and potentially how freedom loving people can get involved, uh, maybe support you um, or get active in their specific locality. Um, so with that, uh, I was going to uh, first probably jump into a little bit of an introduction. Is that okay with you? Totally fine. Yes, go ahead. All right, great. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, um, Elizabeth is a published author. Uh, she is on um, Amazon, and her book is called, um, let's see, Truth is No Defense, right? Uh, and I'm going to provide the link in the um information uh, box here whether you're listening by the way through any of the platforms or channels there are so many i can't keep track of them but uh, anchor whether you're listening to this on youtube or um, any of the other podcast channels there should be a there should be a, some information attached to the podcast so all these links will be there and um, Elizabeth, I'm going to just use a uh, couple of paragraphs here that I grabbed from the official introduction, and then you can add to this if you want. But Elizabeth is married. She has a daughter. And she's an Austrian human rights and anti-Sharia activist. She's a diplomat's, da diplomat's daughter. She was a child in Iran during the Islamic Revolution of 1989. And to be honest, when I read this, I was like, whoa, I'd like to talk to Elizabeth about this. I mean, this piece right here <laughs> is fascinating. So maybe we can do another <laughs> another podcast always. about that. I'll always come back if you want me to. That would be great. Uh, but uh, I'll just keep going here. And she later lived in Iraq, Kuwait, and Libya. During the 1990 invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, she was among the Austrian citizens who were held Hostage. There is another episode <laughs> we can do about that. Um, Elizabeth has worked as assistant to the vice chancellor of the Republic of Austria at the Austrian embassy in Kuwait and the Austrian embassy in Tripoli, Libya. In 2009, she was charged with hate speech under Austrian law for factually accurate statements she has made during a seminar on Islam regarding 
what the Hadith uh, has to say on child marriage. In 2011, she gets convicted of denigrating the teachings of a legally recognized religion in Austria in a Vienna courtroom, and then she was ordered to pay a fine as well. The case was later accepted for a decision at the European Court of Human Rights, and she now works to preserve the freedom of speech we enjoy under the First, uh, First Amendment here in the United States. Elizabeth hosts her own weekly show on, on Encounter the Truth or EncounterTruth.com, rather. Is there anything, Elizabeth, that you would like to add to this very colorful, rich, and fascinating uh, introduction? <laughs> I thought that was going to be enough for you. I mean, you already said, uh, or it sounded to me, you 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 think that perhaps we could have another five or ten shows to cover what I've been through. Well, how can you not? I don't mean to interrupt you, but how can you not? It's like when I'm reading this, I'm 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 like gasping. I'm like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> but anyways, well, any anyhow, these are, these are formal introductions, and I just you know anything personal that you think that you could add to this, or you'd like us to know. Well, you know, it, it most of it is covered in in my book, uh, and and uh, you know, if people want to get to know me better, uh, they should definitely read the book because I do explain uh, who I am, how I got to do what I, what I do. You know, it's, it's, you know, you, you sent me one of the, the, the hit links, uh, by the, what is it? Georgetown, Georgetown bridge, whatever initiative, you know, I read that a few years ago and I, I sent these people an email and I said, well, thanks very much for describing a person that I don't even know. I mean, this is a person that's alien to me that you described in your hit piece. Um, I I come from a I come from a place where I, you know, I I criticize based on not only experience but also based on my readings and my understandings and again personal experience. I I'm pretty pretty sure that these people who write these hit pieces, the SPLC and Bridgetown and uh, Georgetown Bridge Initiative, first of all, they never spoke to me, and second of all, I'm pretty sure that most of these people have never lived Islam, and that's the difference between them and me. Yes, absolutely. I have no doubt, and you know that's why we call them hit pieces because obviously there were. Um, one-sided and then there's an agenda at work that, that that's not an honest uh, journalistic um, uh, attempt to tell a story about what's really going on and um, you know I'm gonna go back to the Georgetown bridge initiative a little later and the um, SPLC but um, uh, let's just let's just begin with living with or under a totalitarian system such as Islam for a long period of time. I think I can relate to that well because I was born and raised in a communist country. And one of the things I tell people, you can read a lot of books about communism or totalitarianism for that matter. You can read a lot of books, but you just don't understand what it is to actually live for a long period of time under and in the midst of a totalitarian system. It's it's just very different experience. Tell me a little bit more about your experience of, um, you know, obviously growing up around Islam and in Islamic countries and um, Sharia and some of the um, impact this has had on you and, and, and your the way you understand Islam. Well, it's this is a very interesting uh, question. And, and as you were asking it, I was thinking, where do I start? Uh, but I think the place to start is when I was when I was six years old. I was first introduced to this totalitarian system of Islam, and it was very interesting because my parents, my father, uh, moved from New York, where I went to kindergarten, to Iran, to Tehran, when the Shah was still in power, and when Iran was a fairly liberal fairly Western-oriented uh, country where we, we as a family, uh, a Western family, did not experience uh, ex restrictions, at least none that I as a six-year-old could remember. But what I did as a six-year-old realize was 
when the Ayatollah Khomeini started instigating and, and rabble-rousing trouble from, uh, from Paris and, and uh, the, the, the demonstrations began, the, the rallies, uh, uh, how the mood changed within the country, how uh, women who were uh, wet dressed in Western dress uh, and clothes and, and no hijab and no, uh, you know, it was, like I said, Western, how that gradually, but the gradual accelerated and, and it then quickly changed. So even I, as a six or seven year old, noticed it. And, uh, you know, the curfews came, and all of a sudden, in late 1978, my mother, my sister, and I were evacuated from uh, uh, Tehran back to Austria in the middle of the night. And I remember the, you know, the thousands and thousands of people at the airport trying to escape what these people knew was going to be hell on earth as a totalitarian system. Of course, they didn't call it that. But, you know, for me, again, I was a six-year-old. I saw uh, how a society can, can change within a very short period of time, and that made a, a lasting impact on me, a really lasting impact. Now, fast forward, um, you know, I grew up, spent some of my formative years in the U.S., which is why my English is, is passable, and, uh, you know, during the, I, I experienced the Reagan years in the U.S., in Chicago, and I was, I was raised in, in, in freedom, in total freedom, uh, in a country that believed in, in, in personal freedoms. Uh, I studied the Constitution in school. Um, I, was, I was introduced to the concept of freedom. And why am I telling you this? This is important if we fast forward to 2021. But um, let me also tell you, I returned uh, to the Middle East in 1990 when I was 19 years old. And uh, again, I was, I was, you know, returning to a very strict Islamic country, Kuwait, um, and I lived Islam. I was 19 years old, so it didn't really bother me that much. I could, I could adapt more easily. Let me fast forward to 1997 when I again returned to Kuwait I was, a, I was a young adult, I was a, a woman of 25 years old, and again, I lived Islam, I experienced um, uh, Ramadan. The first Ramadan was exotic, alien, fun almost, but once you experience Ramadan year after year after year, and you see people, Europeans, obvious non-Muslims being accosted in the streets, during Ramadan for merely chewing gum because they're breaking the fast and you're not allowed to, to eat or drink in the streets, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, that's when the fun stopped for me. That's when I didn't find this very fun because it was totalitarian. Uh, I always believed, you know, you do yours and I do mine. And as long as we're, you know, okay with that, that's how we can live together. But I don't, shouldn't really, you shouldn't care whether I chew gum uh, when you're not, al not allowed to. And I, I, I would want this to be vice versa too, but it, that's not how it works in these countries. And uh, that made me quite, uh, quite unhappy and I wanted to break out. And I knew exactly that this is not where I was going to spend the rest of my life. Um, fast forward to, to Libya. From Kuwait, I moved to Libya in, in 2000. And in order to, to be able to uh, buy food staples and maybe some alcohol, uh, you know, beer or wine, my husband and I needed to, to travel by car to Tunisia to shop there. And it's really interesting when you're, I don't know if this, if this maybe, if you had the same experience, but there are degrees of, of, of uh, freedom. And when you're stuck in a country like Libya and you enter Tunisia, you would actually think, oh my God, you're in the freest country in the world because the degree of non-freedom, of 
you know, this was this Libya was a communist, uh, I would say, a, a communist Marxist Islamic country, uh, as opposed to a cap, mostly capitalist uh, Kuwait. And you leave Tunisia, you leave Libya, and you enter Tunisia, and you breathe a sigh of relief, because you're 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 leaving oppression. But on the other hand, you know exactly that you're in Tunisia, a police state. It is still an Islamic country. And while you are allowed to, as a, as a foreigner, to buy beer and wine, you're still not free. Because, the, again, there's degrees to freedom. But our opponents tell us we don't understand Islam. That's what they always come up with. You don't really understand Islam. You know the, the imams oh, and the, the 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 political hacks, as as, the, as I call them, the the care uh, the cares of the world. These well trained operatives of the Muslim Brotherhood, they're trained how to argue points. They're trained how to talk smoothly, right? And one of the things they tell um, gullible people in the West is, "You don't understand Islam." Now, personally, I think that. Their idea of us understanding Islam means essentially listen to what we tell you, believe it, and when you accept it, that's when you understand it. Uh, that's the only understanding that they have in mind. But how do you counter that? What do you tell your opponents as well as people who want to know? How do we understand Islam? Because I think for us who, who know freedom, who have grown around liberty like you have, uh, we will always understand, quote-unquote, Islam in a way different from what they think we should understand, right? Um, I mean, what you said is is 100% th uh, true and, and, you know, with the operatives. And as you, as you were actually uh, saying these words, again, I was thinking about communism. You know, how it's been... It's been tried so often, but of course, when you look at how how and uh, how communism ravaged, uh, you know, people and and killed people, and uh, destroyed the the you know the wealth of of nations of countries, and still, gullible people believe when they're told, well, we haven't tried real communism yet or real socialism yet. See, whatever the real Islam is, according to these care people, um, there's an, I've seen enough, I've experienced enough, I've witnessed enough. Um, you can call Kuwait a non-Islamic country, which of course is not true, because it's according to its own constitution, a, an Islamic country. So, uh, you know, if, if these care operatives tell me, well, she has no idea what real Islam is, well, hello. Uh, yes, I do know it. Uh, I've I've been there. I've I've done all the studying. I've read multiple translations of the Quran. Um, I've I've talked to people. I I have Islamic people. I've I have I had Muslim friends, numerous Muslim friends. Um, so what else do they expect me uh, and you to do? Um, it can't be rocket science uh, because we're being told that this is very simple. You know, is becoming a Muslim is very simple. Uh, you you say the Shahada and and you're you're a Muslim. So it, it it can't be rocket science. Yet they're telling us it's rocket science. So which is it? And um, you know they they and because they can't get through to you and me because we're so knowledgeable about Islam, and I would argue more knowledgeable than most Muslims are, uh, they resort to ad hominem attacks. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, if you run of, out of arguments, you're going to have to attack the person. So, so be it. I mean, I know, again, I know who I am. I look in the mirror and I see myself and I know who I am. And my family knows who I am. My friends know who I am. And uh, the rest... I really don't care.